Good morning. Happy Sabbath, family. Uh, we're excited that you are here yet again for uh, another Sabbath, another opportunity for us to worship, uh, and more specifically for us to continue our journey uh, in this series called Kingdom Living. Uh, we hope that you have uh, enjoyed us thus far with our overview, and especially now today as we look at Daniel chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Um, let's pray and invite the Lord into this study uh, and that he can bring us some truths here today. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this Sabbath experience. We're thankful uh, for an opportunity to uh, be blessed by you. We pray, Lord, that you speak to us, speak through us, uh, give us a confidence uh, today uh, that you were here and that you would transform us uh, with your word. Uh, bless the vessel and bless the uh, hearers uh, that we would not just be hearers, but doers, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, uh, as we look at uh, kingdom living, uh, I, I just want to do a brief recap of where we were last week to kind of prepare us for where we are today. Uh, we we, we kind of looked at both authors from Daniel and John, and we kind of looked at why it was important to look at their story, because their story gives us context. Their story gives us a certain level of positioning as to how and what the climate was, uh, both liter literally and figuratively, of uh, the landscape of uh, the stories of these books. And I think it's important for us to look at this story for what it is so that we can remove our own bias. That's pretty much the premise of where we were uh, last week as we started with our overview and our intro. Um, before we do that, uh, I, I wanted to remind ourselves of this quote uh, from my girl Ellen in the book of education, page 190. I told you from last week, we're gonna continue to keep reading this and this is gonna be good for our context. Let's read this again, just for the sake of getting ourselves ready for this context. Education, page 190. Look what it says. The student should learn to view the word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy and of the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their workings uh, through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience, how, it, how in every act of life he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives. Friends, this is important for us to remember because we always have to come back to this point to understand the greater narrative. How does Daniel chapter 1, how does Daniel chapter 2, how does Daniel chapter 3 fit into the idea of these two antagonistic forces? How does the narrative of this story that's happening here in Daniel and how he sets the scene for his prophetic visions that happen towards the end, end of the book fit into the two antagonistic motives? Let's look at this. So the first question I want to ask you here is, why prophecy? Um, why use this, this, this way and this tool that we know of prophecy? Well, it, it says here, um, especially here on the screen, it says that prophecy helps us to make sense of God's sovereignty in combination with human free will. Let me say that again. It helps us to make sense of God's sovereignty in combination with human free will. And that's important here, friends. Why? Because let's just address the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is, is that how do I grasp the concept of a God who has complete authority and yet bad things happen in the world? How, how do we work this idea of there to be a God that's so good, yet things happen that are so bad. Well, the, the reason is, is because though God is sovereign here in, in, in the idea, though God 
has sovereignty, it's in combination with human free will. Why prophecy? Is because there's human will here in this exercise. There, there, there's an idea of that sense, sense of it. So let's look at this. As we look at Daniel chapter 1, we'll remind ourselves that Daniel chapter 1 really refers to this, this idea of food. Let's look at it. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, that's Nebuchadnezzar, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, the, uh, the, the, into the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of God. I want to introduce something here when we look at Daniel uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And I want us to kind of agree as to where we are. We look at um, the, 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 the people of God being placed into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, into the hands of Babylon. We look at this and we see that God's people are, are, are being overwhelmed by earthly strength. Stay with me. Earthly strength is the narrative of Daniel chapter 1. Look at this that's here on the screen. Daniel chapter 1, let's, let's agree. We can agree that there is a story that has ended and that there's a story that's about to take place. That the story of God's people has now come to an end here in Jerusalem and now there's a new story that's about to happen with Daniel now being in captivity, the people of God now being in captivity now in Babylon. Watch this. Number two, we can agree that Daniel is literally in the middle of a greater narrative. That Daniel is not the focus of this story, but rather Daniel's story is a part of a greater story. That God's people because of their disobedience, because of their lack of keeping their covenant with God, because of their lack of kingdom living, they fell into the hands of earthly power. And by falling into the hands of earthly power, now you find the, 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 the continuation of a story of God's people who once, who once had their own freedom when they were in the very safety of the Lord, but now have lost it and now have fell under the reins of, of another type of power, of an earthly power, of an earthly type of kingdom. Watch number three. Uh, for every logical perspective, the God of Daniel is taking a huge blow. I mean, think about this here, guys. <laughs> Jerusalem is sacked. The temple is destroyed. The face of God, the, 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 the name and the, 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 the image, the brand of the God of Israel is taking a huge blow here. And earthly power is now put on display. In Daniel chapter 1, we are seeing the force of earthly power and sort of how the name of God has been damaged when God's people fell out of kingdom living. They, I, I don't want you to miss this here because there is a connection between how we live and how we live glorifies the name of God. And when we fell out of that, when, when Israel fell out of that, when there was a, a lack of trust in who God was, a lack of trust in what he was able to do, a more of a want and a will of what Israel is and what Israel wanted, then they fell out of that. And then you see the, 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 the spawn, you see the, 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 the manifestation of earthly power. Watch, watch number four, watch this. We can agree that we, we, we witness the reception of earthly power, that now Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, has shown its force, and has shown its force now as a strength like never before. Um, I want us to notice the irony here. Um, the irony is, if you look at Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, you'll find that the king, of the, the, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, has forced God's people out. But by the time we get to verse 8, not, not even towards the end of the chapter, but by the time we get to verse 8, you see a shift in how earthly power has true power. Watch verse 8. Uh, 
But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's uh, delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requests of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So, don't you think it's kind of strange that King Nebuchadnezzar has the power to take God's people out of their land, but he can't change how they eat? Doesn't it speak a lot towards what earthly power really is and how even though it might seem like it has a lot of force, in reality, it doesn't really have that much power because though it has the power to change your location, it doesn't have the power to change your convictions. It, it, it has the power to, to move things on the external, but it has no power on changing things on the internal. It's important for us to realize that kingdom living is not about what happens on the outside. It's what happens on the inside. And so for too many of us who've seen prophecy, seen the book of Daniel, seen ultimately when we get to the book of Revelation as a story about what will happen on the outside, I'd like to challenge you to realize that it's really about a story about how you keep your convictions, how you remain constant and faithful to a covenant, to a promise that you've made to God and ultimately that God has made to you that he will not leave you nor forsake you when you are in the faith of the Lord. It's ironic here that they have the power to change Daniel's situation, but they can't change his heart. Let's move forward. Let's look at, that's the end of chapter one. Let's move on to chapter two. So a brief outlook of Daniel chapter two. First, Daniel chapter one spoke about the food. Daniel chapter two, we all know Daniel chapter two. Daniel chapter two is about the dream. So let's go this really quickly. I want to look at Daniel chapter two, verses 19 to 23. Daniel chapter two, verses 19 to 23. Watch this. Let's read this. It says, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of our God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his and he shall change times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. Praise God. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O, o thou God of my fathers, who have given me wisdom and might and hath made me known unto made known unto me now what we desire of thee uh, for thou hast known now now have made known unto us the king's matters we, we find that Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and he's troubled by this dream and he tries to find the interpretation of this dream and when his servants fail David uh, Daniel rather he rises Daniel rises with the interpretation of this dream and when he goes to ask God for the 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 the, 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 the answer to this, this dream he he becomes in awe of the revelation that God gives him and he, he's so in awe that he stops and he praises God. And he says, wow, God, you're so amazing because now I get it. I'm realizing the vision of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And I'm realizing that though earthly power does have power to change us, in actuality, you, God, have the power to set up things. You have this whole thing planned out, hallelujah, and that it really doesn't matter about what happens on the outside. I shouldn't have to fear about what happens on the outside, for you take up kings, and you set up kings, and you take down kings. One establishment comes in, and one establishment comes out, but it doesn't matter because you still reign on the throne. I'm thankful that you're able to reveal this thing to me so because now I no longer have to see my captivity in an area of 
fear, but I can see it now as a place of hope because it doesn't matter what my circumstance is, I am still in the safety of the Lord. Can I just pause here and allow someone to realize that no matter what your situation is externally, if your faith with God internally is strong, there's nothing that really can move you, that in perspective, though earthly powers may change, though you might see presidents come and presidents go, you might see all the calamities of health and destruction and all these things that happen, that it really doesn't matter when you are in the safety of the Lord inside of your heart. And so Daniel is enthusiastic about this. Now watch this, watch the irony here. In, in Daniel chapter 2, namely in verse uh, 21, and when we read in Daniel chapter 1, uh, verse 2, you see the parallels. You see the, 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 the idea that Daniel... Uh, is no longer limited by the earthly power because he realized God has really won the victory. Now, how does that play into the greater narrative? Answer, well, the greater narrative is there's these two antagonistic forces. There's this great controversy that there's God and there's the enemy constantly doing battle. And so when I realize this, I'm understanding, okay, the devil is trying to win. The devil is trying to do something by trying to take over God's people with earthly power. But then I realize if I place this into the greater narrative, I don't have to worry about the enemy and what he's doing because God still wins. Ah, can you just take a moment to shout real quick? Can you just take a moment to, 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 to grasp the very goodness of God and how this prophecy message is meant for our good. It's meant for us to win. It's meant that at the end of the day, that all you need to do is be in right relation with God and everything is going to work out fine. This is not a, 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 a prosperity gospel here. This is just the gospel. And the gospel is the good news. And whether you want to accept it or not, the good news is just that good. Let's continue. Watch this. So let's go, let's go really quickly to the, 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 the vision in Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 to 35, it, it really explains the vision here. It explains the vision um, uh, that, that Nebuchadnezzar had. Watch this. Let's read this together. Uh, it says, O king, were, um, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, a great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold and its chest of arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron and um, uh, its feet partly of iron and clay. You watched, this is Nebuchadnezzar's uh, vision, you watched a stone that was cut out without hands and which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and they became like chaff from a summer threshing floor. And the winds carried them away so that there was no trace of them to be found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain filled and filled the whole earth. You see a setup of earthly kings from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome to the other nations. You see this continuation of different nations, continued earthly powers. One comes, one comes down. One comes, another one comes down. You see this constant exchange of powers. And yet you see something different at the end. You see this stone that comes out of nowhere. And when this stone comes, it breaks down the entire structure at its feet, breaks everything down, the gold, the silver, the iron, the bronze, everything, breaks it all down like, like dust that blows in the wind. And this stone now rises up like a great mountain. I, I want us to understand here that this stone is significant. This stone represents something that, that, that's changed. It, it represents something different. Because it's not like the stone that comes that breaks down the statue. It comes in the same succession as the other kingdoms. 
It's not like there was Babylon who was gold and you know, maybe Persia who was silver and so on. And you'll see that finally this, this new stone that comes that is cut out without um, a man's hands came in the same succession. It doesn't work that way. It's unique. It, 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 it comes as like something different, something that they've never seen before, that the world has never seen before. And not only is it something new, but it breaks down every other ideology, every other way that you would see organized structure happen before. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 45. Watch this. Daniel chapter 2, verse 45. You see what the Word of God says. It says, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke into pieces, the iron, the, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure that this stone that's going to come is going to change the world. That this kingdom that's promised is going to change the world. That this idea that, 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 that is challenging the earthly kingdoms will come and destroy everything that you know about kingdom living. Watch this. It, it continues. Watch this. I like this quote by, by one of my favorite preachers, uh, uh, David Asterix. He, he, David Asterix says, watch this quote. It says, the, the stone cut without hands speaks not of succession, but of a total reconfiguration of reality. God, let me say that again. That the stone cut without hands speaks not of succession, not like something that's coming one after the other. It's coming as a total reconfiguration of reality. How does this play to the greater narrative? Well, the greater narrative is two antagonistic forces, two forces that are coming to destroy each other. And in that sense, when you have two forces that are destroying each other, you realize that the stone that is promised is meant to destroy everything that represented the world and what it looked like. You see, the devil had a plan. The devil had a way of trying to rule the world, and that's no longer going to work. Watch this. Jesus mentions this stone in a parable in the book of Matthew. Watch Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Watch this. Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 to 44. The Bible says, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing what? Its fruits, kingdom living. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But, whosoever, who, who, but, who, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Jesus is clever because He's using a line that David gave back in Psalms chapter 118 of this idea of the cornerstone, the, the, the stone that was cut without hands, this stone, this stone that's going to change the world. Look at the, look the quote again. Look, look, go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Let's look, look at it again. The, the, this, this, the, this stone which the builders rejected becomes the chief cornerstone and watch verse 43. Therefore I say unto you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation that bears fruit of it. The promise is, is that this kingdom is going to transform what you know kingdoms are supposed to be and going to be promised to people who are faithful, who have relationship with God. And Jesus uses the idea from David in Psalms chapter 118. Let's, let's read that. Um, Psalms 118 verses 8 and 9 and then again in um, verses 22 to 23. Let's read this. It says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Let me put some context in this here. It's not necessarily just princes. It's, it's, it's officers. 
it's, it's one that are in charge. And so it is better to put confidence in God than put confidence in the established order. It's better to put confidence in God than put confidence in your elections. Better to put confidence in God than put confidence in your structures. Because all of those things are temporary. Those things are soon going to pass away. And the only thing that's going to stand is this chief cornerstone that's going to be built into a, a mountain. And this mountain, this new kingdom, and this style of living is going to be so different than how you've seen living be today. Watch this here, that, that the world that we live in is so chaotic that people bite each other, people uh, gossip about each other, people hate each other, people uh, 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 maneuver around each other, there, there's politicizing, there, there's backbiting, there, there, there's evil intentions in this world, but not the kingdom that God is trying to build. The kingdom that God is trying to build in our hearts first and in the world eventually is a kingdom that loves people. And so that's the reason why God uses this. That's the reason why Jesus used this in that parable. And he relates us to Psalms because he wants us to, to know that the world needs to change. The ideology of the world, not the external things, because those things are going to pass. Kingdoms are going to come and kingdoms are going to go. Don't worry about those things. Care about the ideology of how you live. Care about how you see and view the world. Care about how you love people and you care about people. That's kingdom living. That's the way that God would want us to live. That's the kingdom that he's trying to set up. Watch this. Go back to Psalms. We're in verse 22 to verse 23. Watch this. The stone which the builders rejected, this is the quote for that Jesus gave, uh, rejected had become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. That's a promise, guys. It's a promise, family. It's a promise. It's a good news that what God is trying to change is a spirit, is an intention, is a reality, is a sense of approach. He's trying to change your attitude. I know you're looking for a God who might be changing your external, but God really wants to change your internal. He wants you to live better. Let's continue. This is so good. So watch Revelation. Just, 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 just a quote. I know I'm, I'm cheating right now because I shouldn't be going to Revelation yet. We're still in Daniel chapter 2. But watch Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. This is going to be powerful. Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. See what the Bible says. It says, And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeds out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That the, they were killed, the enemy was killed by the sword, Revelation says. Killed by the sword. But the sword, the weapon, the source of power that God will choose to use to destroy the enemy is not a weapon, not a source of power that is held in the hand, which you think the intention of a sword is when you would use a sword, you would use it in your hand. But no, that's not what Revelation says. Let's go back to the text. It says, and the rest were killed with the sword, which represents power, which proceeds not from the hand, but from the mouth of him. Family, that the, the weapon that God wants to use to change the world is not a source of external power like the other kingdoms do, but rather it is another type of power not wielded through your actions, but wielded through your mindset. The sword that God will use will, portray, will protrude out of your mouth. It is a, a, a sense of ideas. God will change the world by changing how the world thinks. Receive this. Receive this, family. God is going to change the world by the weapon he uses through our testimony. Through the way in which we live, we move, and we have our being. That's kingdom living. 
and I know I'm beating you over the head with this, right? I know I'm, 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 I'm going and doubling back on this same narrative, but that's just what it is. That's just how simple it is, that the world that God is going to change is, is going to be so now filled with hope and prosperity simply by the way in which we treat each other, by the way in which we, we see and perceive certain things. If you don't believe me, watch this. Go, let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 3 to 8. Look at this story. Jesus, watch this, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he had girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answering and said to him, What am I doing you don't understand right now? What I am doing, you don't understand, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus uses this, this idea of washing feet to allow you to realize, I want to change the way you think. Peter, I know you're uncomfortable that I'm washing your feet. And I know you don't, you're not going to understand this now, but I want you to receive this, Peter, because if you can accept me, Jesus, washing your feet, then you can accept you washing somebody else's. If you can accept God washing your feet, then how much more can you then have more empathy and compassion to take care of the people that's next to you? You see, I want to change you, Peter. I want to change you, Shalom. I want to change you, online family. I want to change the way you think by allowing you to realize that there is a love and there is a determination of, of spirituality and, and a goal to change your life that is so appreciated and wanted by God. A desire to change your life for the better. Yeah, you thought Daniel was just about hellfire and brimstone. You just thought this prophecy stuff was supposed to put you in fear. Nah. Nah. Sorry. It's supposed to change the way you feel about yourself. It's supposed to change the way you feel about God. It's supposed to change the way you feel about others. It's king, that's kingdom living. Let's continue. So we did chapter one. We realized that there's earthly kingdoms, but they don't really have as much power as they say they do. We have chapter two, the, the, the succession of kingdoms, and we realize that they have a limit. They're coming to an end. And then there will be this great cornerstone, this wonderful stone that will change ideologies, that won't act the same way that other kingdoms act in the, in the way that, it, that, they, that they, they live and they move, in, in, the, in the way in which they're so trivial. This kingdom is going to change the world. And finally, we get to chapter three. I'm done. I'm done, guys. I'm done. Um, in chapter three, let's go to this outlook. The, 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 the statue of gold. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 uh, to 18. Let's read this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, ferny, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from our, or from your hand, O king. Watch verse 18. Uh, but if not, <laughs> but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. 
we know Daniel chapter 3 that in the complex <laughs> that Nebuchadnezzar was going through, that he was in fear that his kingdom would come to an end. And so he fashioned a golden statue with no succession to represent his kingdom living forever and asked everyone to bow down to it. And when they bow down to it, you know, it, it happened in a way where <laughs> everyone bowed down except the ones who lived for the kingdom, except kingdom li living people, covenant keeping people. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew boys, they're there and they say, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, even if you try to kill us, we're not going to serve you. We believe our God will save us. And if my God doesn't save us, we still won't serve you. God, the audacity of these young men <laughs> to, 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 to brave death like that, to, 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 to not be worried about their own end. That's, that's amazing, the type of life that they lived. I, I want to share with you a quote um, by a, a, a famous Christian author by the name of N.T. Wright. Watch what N.T. Wright says. He says, but resurrection was always a radical, dangerous doctrine. Resurrection was an attack on the status quo. It was a threat to the existing power structures. Why, why am I even quoting this is because the idea of life after death was never truly understood even by you know Jewish people even by the Hebrews they were never really accepted or really believed this concept was sort of foreign that's why it blew their mind when Lazarus uh, rose from the dead or and in that fact even Jesus rose from the dead it was extremely weird but in this sense resurrection is something, is a concept that is so dangerous, it's so radical, because what it suggests to those in power is, my threat for you to follow what I'm telling you to do only lasts until you are willing to die. In other words, I only have power over you if I can threaten the thing in which you love the most. And so resurrection and the story of resurrection, the promise of resurrection is so radical because what it does is it takes the air out of the tire of those in power. Because the, those in power now don't have something to threaten you with. If you're promised with life after death, then why am I worried about dying if I know that I have life eternal? If I know I'm going to have an afterlife, what's the point of me worrying about my first life? Understand the premise. And so you see that earthly power isn't only just limited by the way in which it convicts our hearts. Not only is it limited by the time span that it has, because God puts up kings and pulls down kings, but earthly power is also limited because it doesn't have the ability now to force you to believe and rest in fear. That, that now, if I am a kingdom liver, if I am a covenant keeper, if I'm a person that's following under the promises of God, I'm thankful that there's a resurrection message because now the only thing that earthly powers have over me to destroy me and to hold me down is no longer limited to me. There's good news in the gospel of the resurrection message because in the resurrection message, now I know that there is nothing holding me to this world. I'm shooting for the cornerstone. <laughs> I'm shooting for the promise of a new kingdom. And I'm starting that new kingdom with an ideology, a sword that proceeds out of my mouth, a change in the way I think. 
the three Hebrew boys are no longer under the power of the king of Babylon because they don't fear death. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but can't kill the soul. Watch Hebrews 2, Hebrews, my favorite book of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power, God, of death. That is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The reality is, is that many of us were in fear. Fear of our lives because we felt that our life has an end. But when you stand on the promises of God, when you stand on the covenant of God, when you begin to start to live for the kingdom that will be set up, that will come down and break down all other kingdoms, a kingdom that, that, that was not created with hands, but was created under the mind of God, I don't have to fear death. Yeah, I'm cocky like that. I'm brash like that. I'm bold like that. I'm a Christian that is able to live through it all because I'm no longer under the bondage of death. Put, put the text back. I want you to see it. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Mark that down. Highlight it. God, in, in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through Jesus' death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, which is Satan. That is the devil. And release those who had fear of their own lives. Fear of death where all their life they were subject to bondage. Yeah, this prophecy thing, maybe they introduced Jesus in a way that made you feel like if you didn't accept him, you were going to die. If you didn't accept him, that you were pushed away. This idea of beasts and dragons and, you know, kingdoms and all of these different things that sort of reshape the attitude of what you saw God to be. It's not the story. It's just not. The story is different. Daniel is writing this under the idea of what he's witnessed as, as a captive and what he's been liberated by through the visions of God. Let's land this plane. So Daniel... Chapter 1, 2, and 3, we, we, re we realize this. Just, just follow with me and, and, and write this down for those who are taking notes and you know, studying this and making sure you, 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 you get a conclusion of this. Daniel, Daniel chapter 1 is the reception of earthly power. Obviously, we re recognize earthly power because Daniel was, was captive. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon took them. Um, and so you, you see the, the, the impact that earthly power has, and yet they don't have the power to convict hearts. Chapter 2, you see the end of earthly power. Because as one kingdom comes, one other kingdom ends. As another kingdom comes, one kingdom ends. There's a limit to this earthly power thing. And finally, chapter 3, you see the real limit of power because now kingdoms and earthly powers don't have the ability to hold you to believe what they do, even until death. You're free. That's the gospel. So how, how does this play into the grand narrative? Right? How does this good news play into this great scope of these two antagonistic forces these two big forces that are coming together god and the enemy coming together how does this play out well one god wins that two 
every attempt that the devil will do to destroy you is in vain. And three, all you have to do is to continue to believe in the one who believed in you. And you're set free. The news is, seek after that cornerstone. And allow the promises of God to change your life. Accept the grace and the peace and the calm that comes from the promises of God. I'll end this with, I'll end this, with um, this sort of an explanation that my Shalom family, you know very well. I've said this even when we did our Hebrew series. That the importance of our salvation is really rooted not so much in the events of the world and what happens or what doesn't happen. Uh, our salvation is not rooted in our actions in what we do or we don't do. It's really rooted in the faith and the relationship that we have with him. For the more we believe in God, the more God imparts in us a power to be like him and live for him. And so I, I rest this idea with you, and I want you to wrestle with this this week. When God comes to take his people home, he will come and he will say this line that many of us have practiced <laughs> to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. He will promise me, or he will tell me, well done. And, and I've always been baffled by that because it's like, but God, there's nothing good I could have done. How can you tell me well done and there's nothing I did that was well? What's the context, God? What, do you, what did I do to get this, 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 this worthiness? Well, since I didn't get any context through what he said to those who were saved, I can only get the context by those who are lost. And to those who are lost, he says, depart from me because I never knew you. So what's that to suggest? It's to suggest that the well done I did wasn't based on external things, was actually what the three Hebrew boys were faithful in doing, what Daniel was faithful in doing, in knowing him. That this is life eternal. That they might know him. That they might know him. And Jesus whom he sent. Get to know him. That's kingdom living. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the beginning of the book of Daniel. We're thankful for how the narrative has started. We're thankful for the direction that it's going. And we see that you're setting up a kingdom. You're, you're intentional about removing things of pain and strife and discord and setting up something that's more beautiful and asking for us to come and, and, and be a part of the journey. I pray, God, that you would give us a peace that surpasses our understanding. Help us through your word to be thankful and be happy that we are not pressured by external forces when we live for that kingdom. Bless us as we move through this series and bless our week. In Jesus' name, amen.